Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah rabbil alamin. Allazi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna linahtadi lawla an hadana Allah. Ves salatu ve selamu ala eşrefil enbiya'i vel mursalin. Şefi'a dunubina ve tabibe nufusina. وحبيب قلوبنا بالقاسم محمد الله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين واصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائه المجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لسان يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ الله جرنا وجركم بمسابنا بأبي عبد الله والسلام والسلام As we go into our lecture I would just like to take this opportunity and Alhamdulillah it's a, a good congregation and for the fear that it may not reconvene beyond this point to very genuinely and sincerely apologize to you for any hurt or injury that my words or expressions may have caused and for usage of expressions or language in a less than sophisticated befitting manner at times I acknowledge very crude the intention was not to cause any injury, that is for sure. But of course, we must take responsibility for the way in which we talk and the way in which we express and the way in which we explain. And of course, there is no justification for causing any, any hurt to any soul. I hope you will find it in your hearts that if I have done that, to forgive me and to forego and to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this humble slave of his and a servant of yours to be forgiven and to be enlightened. It is a very somber night and I remember this hadith in which Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu states that inna umurana fi kulubi muhibbina Indeed our graves are in the hearts of our lovers and the hearts of the lovers of the truth should always, always be held as precious, godly, sacred places. It's a beautiful poem said by an, uh, an individual, I've forgotten his name, in Urdu. Break the mosque, burn the churches, raise to the ground the temples, but do not injure the heart of a human, for therein lives a God. In these hearts dwells not only the light of Allah, but the most magnificent, brilliant representation of that light in the name of Hussein ibn Ali sallallahu alayhi And in his remembrance, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten us, increase our light for us, and complete our light, and may we join him and his band when we go onwards in the next journey of life. And may his beautiful example lead us through this, this life of ours and in the trials that we face in this life. The final component of what we were saying is the beautiful practical and pragmatic appeal and application of Islam. One of the things we fail to understand through our naivety is that we are human beings. Is that there is a certain nature that we have. Is that existence flows from a strength, from a level of weakness to strength, <coughs> building on its own self. And that we as human beings are no different. We take birth in a state of weakness, in a state of dependency. 
from the cradle and from the lap to a level where we carve out our own destinies and the destinies of those around us. Similar is the case of human society from the time of Adam till now, from weakness to strength. And same is the case of any society in this relative individualistic world of ours that is undergoing evolution. Every community starts off from weakness into strength. This flow from weakness into strength requires a lot of care, a lot of appreciation, a deep understanding of how human beings are, appreciation of human frailty and human weakness, ability to balance human life, a very realistic understanding that humans have the tendency to destroy as they have the tendency to create. They have the tendency to take as they have the tendency to give. They have the tendency to hate as they have the tendency to love and be merciful and compassionate. They have the tendency to stifle through arrogance and ego as they have this beautiful yearning inside to submit to the God of Gods and to flow in expansion to Allah SWT and give their own. It requires this understanding of the human nature. It requires a deep understanding of how to convert negativity into a force of good. It requires this understanding of how to allow individuals to accept themselves and to love themselves and not to loathe themselves. To convert what they call are their darknesses into those stallions that take flight and soar to the heavens above until they reach upon the thresholds of divinity itself. It requires all this acute understanding. Humanity cannot evolve but in the cradle of compassion, tolerance, appreciation. Just as a child is raised within the lap of a compassionate mother, a mother is known as the reflection of God on the face of this earth. She has the raham, the womb, the name of that Raham is taken from Rahma of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he is Rabbul Alameen, then that is his motherly aspect, the aspect that nurtures the world. Just as a child in the cradle of mercy and compassion grows into a fine human being, the human community similarly needs to evolve within the cradle of compassion and cradle of mercy. This is what the Prophet did. This is what the Quran teaches. This brilliant appeal of the godliness within human life, taking into consideration the frailties of humanity. How did the Prophet do what he did? And where have we failed? The Prophet understood human life for what it was. We, in our simplistic notions of right and wrong, piety and ungodliness, only know black and white. The world of God is not black and white. The world of God is full of different shades of color. There is more gray than ever can be imagined of black and white. And it's that gray area that adds charm to human existence. And this is what the Prophet did and the Prophets before. They looked at the weaknesses of human beings and they nurtured the human beings through their weaknesses. They realized the individual as being weak. They realized the communities as being weak. And the appeal of this religion was extremely practical and pragmatic, which ensured its success. In today's world, the Muslim has no scope of error 
no scope of weakness, no scope of sin, no scope of experimentation, no scope of learning, no scope of tolerance, no scope of appreciation, no scope for bringing about strength through weakness. Now if we go to the prophetic community, look at how these people were. These people were murderers, they used to bury their daughters. A person comes to the Prophet, listen to this example carefully. He said, Ya Rasulullah, is there forgiveness in your religion, in your heart, and in your God for the likes of me? He said, explain. I buried five of my daughters alive. The sixth daughter, when it came, when she came, my wife told me that it was a stillborn child. Instead, gave it to our neighbors. The neighbors raised our daughter. And our daughter used to come to our house. And I became overly attached with her. When she came of the age of four and five and six, my wife witnessing this strong bond of love between me and her finally disclosed to me that she was my daughter. After she disclosed this to me, I said to my child, come, let us go to the desert to play a little game. When she came to me, with me to the desert, I asked her, oh child, help me dig a hole. She dug a hole with me. I asked her to enter into that hole. She entered. I began to place the dust and the sand above her. When it came to her neck, she said, Oh, Father, I no longer like this game. She said, Take me out of here. I carried on pouring the sand into her, upon her, until she suffocated and died. The eyes of the Prophet poured with tears. And he said, Allah has forgiven you. Start afresh. This was the community that he came to. And the time he leaves this community, it's a glorious community. How did he do it? <coughs> Through a very realistic understanding and appreciation of how human beings are. And through this understanding and belief in human goodness and the overall goodness. We cannot do anything with the community until we believe in the goodness of the community. If the Prophet did not have this blind belief in the community, he could have not taken this murderous, inhumane community from that pedestal of animality to this pedestal of glorious humanity. He had full conviction in what he was doing. And he believed in their humanity, and he appreciated their humanity, and he appreciated the little good that they had. And this is what was the key to his success, to bring about that glorious human community. You heard that example of a drunkard or person who consumed alcohol came to the Prophet, and he said, I consume alcohol, and I'm not ready to stop it, even for you. The Prophet smiled, he said, well, what can you stop for me? And he said, well, I'll stop lying for you. The Prophet said, that is fine. Later on, he came to the Prophet and he said, well, I've given up alcohol because I was forced to lie about my activity to your companions. And through the embarrassment, I left consumption of alcohol. The Prophet smiled and he said, well done. And he said, by the way, lying is the mother of all evil not consumption of alcohol. And then look at the Qur'an, the gentle way in which it brings people to the completion of their journey. The law of alcohol was introduced gradually, very gradually. <coughs> and finally the prohibition came. But look at the Muslim community. There is no tolerance. If somebody is a drunkard, does that mean we shun them away? How different is that person from the Sahabi of the Prophet 
who went in front of Rofer and said, I consume alcohol. What, how different is he? Our minds are not with it. We have not understood the notion of sin or transgression. <coughs> As I said this in the first lecture, Imam Sajjad speaks to Allah very openly, very intimately. And this is the bond that needs to be created. He says to Allah, O oh Lord, I have been a sinner. And I've been a great sinner. I seek forgiveness from you. But let me not be dishonest with you. Let me be genuine with you. Even as I seek forgiveness from you at this point, I know I shall sin once again. O oh Lord, if I do sin, then it is partly your fault. You need to have that intimacy with God to speak like this. Partly it is your fault, for you have spoiled me by forgiving me all the time. And you have made it a habit of mine. O oh Lord, if I do sin, it is not because I don't see you worthy of worship. It is only through my weakness that I commit sins. There is a difference between a sin and a sin. A person is weak and they sin. And a person says to Allah, I do not care for your wish and your command. And there's another one who is sinning, but says to Lord, I'm embarrassed of you. But I am a weak creature. These beautiful souls, the Prophet and the Imams, they distinguished between these sentiments. And they understood them well. And they coach their community through this beautiful human frailties where they converted them. Mahmoud Shabastri says, there comes a time when Toba needs to be rejected altogether. For Toba becomes the greatest sin. When a person finds that they can't show their faces to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are so embarrassed of themselves. At that point, Toba becomes the greatest defeat. Toba becomes the sin at that point. It's like a person who has failed an exam. The thought of failure daunts him so much that it deprives him of his confidence. Mahmoud Shabistri says at that point, throw away Toba and go to your Lord in a state of confidence as if you are innocent. Your Lord wants that from you. And then there is this beautiful hadith in Kitab al-Mu'min. There is a reason why I am narrating this on this night. Because we want to drive home a very important facet of this theory. There is a hadith in Kitab al-Mu'min in which Amir al-Mu'minin says that on the day of Qiyamah, when the believers awaken, they shall look inside their books and they will find no trace of sin therein. Through embarrassment, they will look towards the throne of Allah. And from their hearts, they shall plead to Allah and say, O oh Lord, I acknowledge I am a sinner and I have sinned in my life to an amount unaccountable, yet my book bears no trace of it. And Allah shall respond to them, O oh my creature, my might, my glory, my sense of pride and dignity, does not allow me that anyone other than me see your sins. Like a mother of mothers and father of fathers. This was Islam in practice in the time of the Prophet. Taking people, giving them confidence in their humanity. Telling them that whatever you have is not evil. You can convert all of that and it leads to goodness. Gently converted. This was the prophetic appeal. And this is exactly what we find within the Quran. Human frailties are not frowned upon. They are looked upon very positively. And they are told to convert them. And they are always told, don't expect yourselves to become angels. You are human beings. You are supposed to be this way. And through the ambit of weakness, context of weakness, try to bring about as much goodness as you can. This is the way life was. 
the Sahaba used to go to the Prophet and say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, in your presence we feel pure, we feel good. As soon as we leave you, we are tarnished once again through transgressions and sins. The Prophet smiled and he said, Is there anything else to life but this? This is how life is supposed to be. Try your best, gently, with full confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become good people. This was the appeal within the Prophet's message. Not this, that a Muslim community is supposed to be the best community from birth. It doesn't happen. It's never going to be the case. People are going to be weak. People are going to be frail. Why is it then that we can accept the Prophet nurturing and educating his community, but the leadership within the Muslim communities cannot tolerate any flaws from their community? The expectation is so high that the people are frightened away from Islam altogether. If I'm permitted, I'll share another story. It's an anecdote. If it takes a little longer, if not a fiery mud, this is that you've been used to from me for the last few days, then forgive me. For the soul has its own ups and downs. And I suppose my soul is on a downward trend right now, or a calmer trend. It's on a retreat right now. And I'll be true to my own soul. Salawat. Oh. Nothing worse than pretentiousness. There was a person I knew, and from childhood would go and sit in his company. I'm going to say things that might appear strange to you. He would consume alcohol can upon can, but was a very nice man, a lovely man. But he would drink alcohol excessively and smoke. And of course I would share a cigarette with him. You were in my younger days. The only day he would not drink was the day of Ashura. Because the mosque would not allow him inside the mosque reeking of the smell of alcohol. So for the sake of Imam Hussein, he would not drink on the day of Ashura. It was very, very difficult for him. I used to look at him and I used to think, SubhanAllah, he's struggling. He would run home after Shana Gariba and just open as many cans as he could. He was a drunkard. I went to Iran, came back from Iran, and I heard that he's on his deathbed, that the whole of his body has been consumed by cancer, everything from head to the stomach and intestines. I went to him. He was on his deathbed. Listen to this story very carefully. And I said, how are you? He said, Arif, light up a cigarette. Let's smoke together. He's on his deathbed, and we are smoking. He said, now we've smoked, read a Yasin so that I can hear. I said, what about alcohol? He said, yes, I had to give up because I'm dying now. And of course, it's not good for me to go in this way. I turned to his children and I said, he's not going to live through tonight. I will expect a call from you tomorrow. This was a Sunday. They said, no. He had said something else. I said, what? He said, they told me, that he, that the angel of death came to him and he said, in a very crude way, villager from back home, he said, run away to the angel of death. Run away, in our language. I haven't seen my family as yet. I want to bid them all farewell. So he said, the angel said, I will come and take you on Sunday at 12 o'clock. I said, it's impossible. He's not going to live. I waited the next day. No news of his death. The day after, no news. The day after, no news. I went back on Thursday. And I'm baffled. I'm saying, why doesn't he die? There is no reason for him to live for another hour. He doesn't have it in him. I mean, after so many years of watching people die in front of me, and in my own arms, you know when a person's time has drawn near. When they don't eat anymore, they don't drink anymore, you know they're going to go. But his family hadn't come to see him yet, not all of them. <coughs> On Thursday night, I said to them, look, he is going to die tonight. There is no way he can pull through. We will bury him tomorrow. I'm expecting a call from you. 
and I will personally see to his funeral rites. Friday came, nothing happened. <coughs> Sunday came, I was with a group of friends. Twelve o'clock, I looked at my watch. Twelve o'clock, the phone rang. And his son said, he looked at us, he bid us all farewell, precisely at twelve o'clock, and he died. Who knows? Who enjoys that rank with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who knows? We are looking at the Prophet of Allah and we are seeing his gentle ways, the way he appreciates humanity, the way he distinguishes between sin and sin, between godliness and weakness, and between ungodliness and goodness, the way he understands so accurately, why should our community be any different? <coughs> why should it be any different? If his community flows from weakness into strength, then why doesn't this community flow from weakness into strength? If he is so tolerant, then why is, aren't our communities tolerant? If somebody comes to Ali ibn Abi Talib and says, apply the capital punishment upon me, for I have fornicated, and Ali ibn Abi Talib dissuades them and makes them run away. Or if somebody comes to the Prophet and says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, stone me, for I have sinned. The Prophet said, you are mistaken, you don't know what you're talking about, and dissuades them and makes them go away. And when a person comes to the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, I was the one who made him come and confess to you. The Prophet tells him angrily, why did you cause a life to be wasted? Had he not disclosed this to me, kept it between him and his Allah, and asked for forgiveness, Allah would have forgiven him. He would have had a lengthy life in which he would have made amends and done far more good. If this was the attitude of the Prophet, why should our attitude be any different? If the Prophet applied his Islam so gently, so meaningfully, appreciated human beings' humanity, then why should we be deprived of this? I will give an instance about godly soul to you. Hussein has fallen from his steed. There is a cry, await not, behead the man. They say, we closed in on Hussein. When we observed his face, the radiance upon his face, the way his lips moved in the praise of Allah, by Allah it deterred us from the thought of cutting his head. We have not seen a man so hungry, so thirsty, so wounded, so lonely, and yet, in a state of such contentment, radiating. At that point somebody said, I drew near to him, and I said to him, O oh man, are you the grandson of an apostle promised to us at the end of time? He said, yes, I am. <laughs> He said, do you have forgiveness in your heart for me? And Hussein said to him, I forgive you for the sake of Allah. At that point, such are these godly souls and the way in which they have nurtured their community. If we look at the Quran, we see a very different message. A message that we have forgotten. A human friendly message. A message in which godliness is allowed to evolve within animals, until these animals become God. A very realistic understanding of life, in which the Prophet is not even understanding, there's no delusional sense in the Prophet's mind that everybody becomes angelic. He's very well aware how the people are. He knows that he will never get angelic people, and yet he brings about the best that this community can produce. Now look at the Quran. And the beautiful way in which the Qur'an teaches us these things. I want to give examples. The Qur'an teaches us how to become Muslims. And at the same time in a very realistic way. Not in this sort of a mystified way in which we have understood. And hence we can never apply that true Islam. Neither in our lives, nor in the household, nor in our communities. And neither does it have the appeal to embrace humanity at large because we have forgotten this human appeal, the practicality and the pragmatic way 
in which Islam is to be applied within human community. In Surah An-Nisa, Allah says to the believers, when these people are mocking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then stand and leave them until they engage in another conversation, then rejoin them. What is our sense of piety? Our sense of piety is disassociation totally, isn't it? We disassociate, this is the enemy of God. But look at the Quranic understanding. The Quran says, you are a human community. They are your friends, brethren. They are your family. When they speak ill of Allah, at that point stand away. But you can't separate them. Separate from them. This is your family. This is your context. This is your community. When they speak of other things, then go back and resume with them. Imagine how arduous life would become if Allah were to say, disassociate totally. But Allah is very practical, very pragmatic. For that point, stand up. And then of course, it's your social need to be with them, then go back to them. This is how much leverage Allah gives. Then again, look at the beautiful way in which Allah explains. When in the battle of Ohad, and this is phenomenally the Prophet, the Prophet gets news from Abbas, his uncle, that the Meccans are going to attack Medina. The Prophet says that we will stay within the four walls of Medina and defend ourselves. The people of Medina vote against the Prophet. As a leader, he has a God-given right to put his foot down and say, I am the Prophet. I know best what I'm saying. Do you know what he does? He concedes. And goes with the majority. Okay, we will face them outside Medina. And when he is going outside Medina, thousand people oppose him and they say, we will not come with you. He is the head of state. He does not enforce himself. He says, fine, stay behind. Now before we resume this, another example, that at a particular time in Medina, certain crop, crops had become scarce. And there was rationing. The businessmen had hoarded the crop and were selling it for extortionate sums of money. Somebody went to the Prophet and they said, why don't you fix the price of crop? Do you know what the Prophet said? In the akrahu at tasheer I dislike fixing prices. If the promise of hereafter is not sufficient to move them from their greed, no matter how many laws we bring, it will not make them into better human beings. Look at his mindset. The Prophet goes out into Ohad to receive the enemy. Majority of these people, what do they do? When there is a call that Muhammad has been killed, what do they do? Majority of them go to Abu Sufyan. And they say that we are ready to worship Lat and Uzza, don't kill us. And a lot of them ran away from the battlefield. This is what the Prophet sees. What do you do at that point? Wouldn't you be totally demoralized that this is the first community I've set up and this is what is in their hearts? And of the sum total of the people who are with the Prophet, how many are with the Prophet at that point? The historians count 15. Out of whom Talha and Imam Ali are the two unanimously concurred upon by everybody that these two are definitely with the Prophet and apart from them there were 13 others maximum. So apart from 15, the whole of the community of Medina Muslims ran away. Either they went to join with Abu Sufyan or they fled. But imagine the way the Prophet was and the way he understood. He dealt with that situation in the best possible way. Allah taunts them and he said, look, in Badr, you used to say, we want that because of what you heard of the lofty ranks of the martyrs of Badr. And Allah says, I gave you, I gave you the opportunity to die here, but you ran away. They felt such remorse in their hearts that it reformed them. And the Prophet gave that opportunity back. <coughs> and somebody like, a person like Muhammad Abdo, who is the commentator of Nahju Balaga, he said, I saw in my dream that the Prophet said that the loss at Ohad was better than any victory. 
because the Muslims were complacent into thinking in this because they are Muslims, they will be given victory all the time. And Allah says, Tilka layamu la wiluha bainan nas. Just because you're Muslims doesn't mean victory is assured. As I've given you victory today, I'll give them victory tomorrow. Your enemies. The true standard and yardstick of success and failure is other than victory and defeat. And then Allah teaches them that success in defeat is in turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as success in victory is in turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not the gain of this world. And this is the beautiful way in which the Prophet appreciates the frailties of his community and begins to teach them. And then, after that incident, Abu Sufyan warns the Muslims. And he says that there is a trade fair. If you come to the trade fair, we will slaughter you. Only 15 people come with the Prophet and the rest of the Madanese community reject the Prophet's proposal that they should go to the trade fair. Allah says, Ya Rasulullah, I do not burden anyone but you and whoever follows you. You are not burdened beyond that point. So the Prophet goes with 10 to 12 people to the trade fair, yes? The rest of Medina stays in Medina. This is the frailty of the Muslims. And the Prophet is appreciating this and dealing with this. Now, when these 10 15 people go, Surah Al Nisa explains that when you pray, go in front of them, let a line pray behind you, and when they finish, let another line come and hold your weapons. Do not become mindless of it, for indeed the disbelievers are desirous that you should become mindless of your weapons so they should attack you. <coughs> now look at the pragmatic way and the practical way in which Quran is addressing the whole issue. You see, for me and you, what is piety? To pray a salah in a way that we are unaware of anybody around us. And then when a Mulana says that, by the way, you weren't praying properly, the Mahmoud will say, Mulana, are you looking at me or are you praying? <laughs> That's a normal taunt we get, right? And isn't that true? Or are you praying your salah or are you looking at me? You see, that's the mindset that piety means when you're in your prayer, you're just with God and nothing else. If that was the case, the Prophet should have known that better, shouldn't he? We have totally got it all skewed up, honestly. We've got it messed up in our heads. The Prophet used to pray Salah. If anybody used to stand in front of him, he used to quickly finish his Salah and say, yes, what can I do for you? He did not want to miss out on an opportunity. The Prophet should have been so immersed in his prayer that he should not have been aware of who is standing in front of him. Isn't that so? By our reckoning and our standards of piety? The Prophet should have been oblivious to his surrounding. But the Prophet was very much aware of his surrounding. He did not distinguish piety as worship to God as opposed to being aware of the world. Now here, piety for Allah was a very pragmatic issue. It was a very practical issue. When Khalid bin Walid, who was waiting to ambush these Muslims with his group of Meccans, when he saw this, that these people are praying behind the Prophet and still carrying their weapons and are aware, he said, my God, this is the God that they worship who is so practical. He is allowing them to devote themselves to him and yet he is making them mindful of the dangers that are around them. And at that point Khalid bin Walid switched and became a Muslim. This was the practical appeal of Islam in a very realistic way, in a very real context. That the human frailties were understood. Then again in Surah An-Nisa, Allah SWT teaches them that when you are in danger, then pray the Salah on horseback or walking. And when you're in safety, then do the Ruku and Sujood. It's a very practical religion. You know, we guys, we say that no, on the plane, we have to go and do Ruku and we have to do Sajda. Yes? We insist on that, don't we? But tell me, we insist as well that the Tawaf cannot be done from the first floor of the Kaaba because it's overlooking the Kaaba 
and tawaf can only be done at the same level of the Kaaba because otherwise it's not known as tawaf around the Kaaba. On the plane, when you're five miles up in air, which Kaaba is in front of us? Surely we should be praying Salah like this, standing at an angle. Shouldn't we? But look at this beautiful appeal that the Quran has. Everything is applicable and applied in a beautiful way. This is something that the Muslim in the present has missed. To know that different communities and different societies are at a different level of the revolution. And when Islam is applied to them, it is applied to them in their own context. And it is taken from weakness into strength gradually. And it looks and is very much aware of its surrounding and its environment. And in accordance with that, the decisions are make, made of what is piety and what is otherwise. When it comes to communal spirituality, what does the Prophet teach us? He says, and Ali ibn Abi Talib teaches this, when you're praying Salah in Jama'at, pray it quickly. There is no question of praying the slow Salah. The day I understood that was on the Dhuhr, in, at the time of Dhuhr, in August, in Karbala, when I was standing on the burning sand and there was a Jamaat behind me. I said, SubhanAllah, this is what it means, pray it quickly, because communal spirituality is other than individual spirituality. The Imams have said, your Nawafil, take as long as you want, because that is personally between you and your God. But when you're in a community, Make it easy for people, for communal spirituality comes through ease. For them to socialize is better than for them to do dhikr and for them to pray. These are those beautiful sentiments of Islam in which the application of Islam becomes a very realistic thing. In every environment, we are supposed to take care of that beautiful environment. We are supposed to appreciate the levels at which people are and not expect the same standard from everyone. In fact, not even judge. And I want to point at something here which might appear to be a very cheap sort of a dig again. But in the early 80s, the beard was an issue. After the coming of the revolution, beards became wajib. Yes? And a person who did not have a beard was less than a Muslim. To the extent what happened was that two very genuine people of the community, they came and they said to us, we saw the moon. I was a young man at that time and everybody said, you don't have a beard. We can't trust you. They said, well, we've never lied. We said, well, you don't have a beard. Now the thing is, I will give my chest to one of those people who's a heart surgeon to break through my ribs, take out my heart, replace all the arteries, and put it back in, plug me back, give me another lease of life for 20 years, but he tells me I've seen the moon, and I'll say, no, you don't have a beard. But I can give him my chest to be operated upon, to be dissected, but you don't have a beard. And then what happened? Well, what is a beard? Well, anything that's a beard, so we started ending up with micro beards. So I have a beard for the sake of having a beard. Does it have any purpose behind it? And then what happened? The poor barbers came to us. And they said, look, now we can't shave people's beards. And we are losing out on trade. I'm just saying, try and understand the extent to which we are trying to say the relevance of this particular facet that Islam applies to communities in accordance with their own state of existence. It appreciates in a very real way the state of the community and where it needs to arrive to in accordance with its own frailties. There is appreciation of humanity and there is application of Islam at a very gentle level and that is most befitting. When Sahib Zaman comes, and as we will conclude on Friday, he will create a very human conducive atmosphere 
where souls find it very easy to evolve in their own limited contexts through their own limited abilities. And that would be Islam of the 12th Imam. If we can arrive at that today, we can apply it and bring about a very beautiful state of Islam. The other thing, and we'll finish with this, this talk, that the Prophet was not in a fanciful world. He understood the real state of humanity. He knew we cannot make angels out of everybody. He knew that people will always make slips. He knew people will always fall. And what he did was, he brought about a situation in which good was managed. In which the bad in human beings was minimized by allowing human beings to allow their own good to prevail upon their own evil. But he was never in this fanciful world in which he for a minute thought that evil can be done away with. He acknowledged evil and used it to promote the good and still had this understanding, acute understanding, that evil will always remain and will always be there. In our present society, we must be mindful of that and we must be aware that it's a question of managing the two and gradually and slowly bringing about the best. Otherwise, Islam itself promotes all forms of ugliness as we've seen in the history of Islam, through Islam itself. For when there is waywardness within, it justifies itself through religion. Today, most of the wrong that is done within the Muslim world is done through Islam. Yes? Islam condones it. Killing of the other, Islam condones it. Non-appreciation of the other, Islam condones it. Exclusivity of salvation, Islam condones it. Coercion of the other, Islam condones it. The same Islam, which is the true state of humanity and growth of humanity, can be totally perversed and misunderstood in that way. If we have a realistic understanding of Islam, it can promote. But back in the day, it was no different. The same people who saw the Prophet with their own eyes, and they saw Hussein ibn Ali riding upon the shoulder of the Prophet, are the people who are signing the death warrant of Hussein. The same people who have memorized the Quran are condoning the killing of Hussein. A person who has worked for Ali ibn Abi Talib as a governor, he is bribed by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad into permitting the killing of Hussein ibn Ali. This is how Islam can go off on a tangent. It is the night of Ashura. Hussein ibn Ali is in his tent. These are the descriptions. The way he is devoting himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way his companions are devoting themselves to Allah. Seventy people from the army of Yazid <coughs> defect. Some of them join with Hussein and some of them leave Karbala altogether. And they say the people who devote themselves to Allah in this way cannot be people who are evil. Zainab begins to miss her Hussein on this night. She comes out of her tent and comes to the tent of Hussein and she finds it unguarded. In a state of rage, she says to herself, I will indeed question Abbas and Akbar about this. How dare they leave my brother unguarded on such a sensitive night? She lifts the cloth of the tent and looks inside and she finds Hussein is in devotion in such a Devoting himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. She finds certain comfort in her heart. But 
resolved as she is, she turns to the tent of Abbas. As she nears the tent of Abbas, she hears words and sounds emanating from the tent. She lifts the cloth of the tent and she sees that Abbas is in the center of the tent. With his blade in his hand, he is polishing his blade upon his knees and the Hashimites are circling Abbas. Abbas calls out, O sons of Hashim, what is your intention tomorrow when the battle breaks out? Akbar, the brothers of Abbas, Qasim, sons of Muslim, sons of Aqil, they say, O Lord, O Master, O Abbas, the command is yours. Say, and you shall find this obedient. Abbas says, Tomorrow, when the battle breaks out, you shall be the first ones to give your lives. Least anybody says that Hussein favored his family upon his companions. Zainab is filled with emotions, begins to choke upon her tears. She leaves the tent of Abbas. As she is advancing, she hears similar noises from the tent of Habib. She stands near the tent and looks within. She finds Habib in a similar way she found Abbas. Habib is in the center of the tent and the Ansar and the friends of Hussein are rotating around Habib. He calls out, O Ansar, Ya Ma'shir al-Ansar, O helpers of Hussein, why have you come into this wilderness? Why have you divorced your wives? Why have you abandoned your homes and your children? They said, O Habib, to be with our Hussein. He asked, what shall you do tomorrow when the battle breaks out? They said, Habib, the command is yours. You shall find this obedience. He said, you shall be the first ones to give your lives tomorrow. Least anybody says that the companions of Hussein valued their lives above the family of Hussein. Zainab is filled with emotion. She is retreating. And as she is retreating, she finds Hussein in front of her. When she sees Hussein, she breaks into a faint smile. When Hussein observes this smile, he says, Oh sister, from the time we have left Medina, your face has been deprived of a smile. What brings a smile to your lips on this fateful night? She explains the situation to Hussein, what she has heard. Hussein says, Oh Zainab, do you wish to see the loyalty of the people I have with me? She says, yes, O Hussein, test them, and I can observe. He says, stand behind the date tree. She stands behind the date tree. Hussein calls out, O Abbas, O sons of Hashim, O Akbar, come to me. O Habib, O Ma'shir al-Ansar, hasten to me. They come running to Hussein. They say, yes, O Master. He gathers them, and he says to them, by Allah, Tomorrow, a bloody battle shall break out. By you giving your lives, I shall not be spared. But you may decide to choose the cover of this night to go away and save your lives. No sooner has Hussein said this, that they unsheathed their swords and put it upon their necks. They say, O oh, Hussein, do you doubt our loyalty? By Allah, if you are to command us, we will behead our own souls and place our heads in front of you. Hussein looks at them and says, What shall you do tomorrow? Muslim ibn Ausaja was where pain. He says, Oh Hussein, tomorrow we shall engage your enemies with our swords. When our swords break, we shall fight with them with spears. When the spears break, we shall throw stones at them. When stones finish, we shall fight them with our bare hands. When our hands are cut, or Hussein. If after that we are beheaded, and if our bodies are cut into thousand pieces, and if after that every piece is burned to ashes, and if after that our ashes are scattered in thin air, we will yearn from Allah to restore us once again, so that we may give our lives for you once again. Hussein said, Indeed, Allah has not blessed any messenger. Any apostle, any wasi, any imam before me with the companions of the likes that he has blessed me with. 
He said, look upon the heavens and see what awaits you. They look into the skies and they see what awaits them. And they say, oh Hussein, if it was not preempting your order, we would indeed have fallen within the battlefield and gone and killed your enemies to receive what awaits us. Hussein turns to Zainab. He says, oh sister, are you pleased? She wipes her tears. She says, oh brother, I am pleased that they shall stand by you tomorrow. Ali ibn Mawahir is present, the brother of Habib ibn Mawahir. Hussein says, O oh people, O oh Ansar, who have come to us with your women and children, go to the clan of Asad and give your wives in safety and children in safety to them. For by God, after I am killed, my sisters, my children, my daughters, my women will be taken as captives and driven in the streets of Kufa and Shah. <clears throat> Ali ibn Madahir comes to his tent. His wife asks him, Oh Ali, what was Hussein saying? He said, he asks me to go and give you in the custody of the clan of Bani Asad. She said, but why? Because Zainab and Kulthum will be taken as captives after Hussein's death. She strikes her head upon the pole in the center of the tent and she says, Sorrow be your lot, O Ali. Shall the daughter of Muhammad be taken as a captive and your wife be in the safety? How dare you suggest such a thing? Go and give yourself for Hussein and let me be with Zainab. The night progresses. Nafir bin Bilal reports, I saw Hussein advancing in the battlefield of Karbala, in the plains of Karbala. I followed him, least anybody ambushed him. He turned back. He said, Nafa, what is it that you do? I said, oh, master, I provide safety for you and protection. I asked him, oh, Hussein, what is it that you do? I wish to examine the battlefield for tomorrow. I want to see where the ditches are, where the highs and the lows are. I wish to see where the trees are, from whence the enemies can ambush us. I accompanied him. He walked a distant. Then he stood and he cried. I asked him, O oh Master, what is the reason for this? He said, Here, O oh Nafe, shall my Akbar fall from his steed. We walked on. We came to a place where he placed his hands upon his face and he cried out aloud. I said, oh, say, what may this be? Nafe, here is where my lion will fall. We went ahead. He came to a place. He sat down and did not have the strength to stand. I said, Master, what happens here? My Asgar will be quenched with an arrow at this point. <laughs> he went ahead, he said, Nafa, I beseech you for Allah. Do not follow me beyond this point. <coughs> As he was going ahead, I heard a woman wailing and crying. I said, Hussein, this is a woman who cries for her son. Who may this be? This, O oh, Nafa, is my mother. What is this place? This is where your Hussein shall be slaughtered. Ashur comes to pass. The bloody battle takes place. Hussein has lost his Abbas. He comes to the tent and bids them farewell. He ascends his steed looks to the right and calls out, Ya Fursan al-Hija, Ma li ad'ukum fala tujibun. O my brave warriors, what has become? I call on to you, but you respond not. I ask for you, you come not. 
by Allah. Death has deprived them of a tongue. He looks again and calls out, Hal min nasirin yansuruna, Hal min mughithin yughithuna. Is there a helper who may come to our aid? As his pleas fill the air of Karbala, there are cries that arise from the tent. Hussein swiftly goes back into the tent and he says, has a child died out of thirst? And they say, Hussein, he turns in his cradle. Every time you let out your istighatha, or Hussein, he dies of thirst. His mother has no sustenance to offer him. Oh, Hussein, take him. Quench his thirst. Oh, Merubab is hopeful that my Hussein will leave this world, but I shall find him in my little Azgar for as long as I am alive. Take this child, oh, Hussein. Quench his thirst. Hussein places his cloak upon Asghar, ascends his Zuljana, rides towards the enemy slowly. He comes with the Quran to save his life for arbitration with the Quran. He unveils the living Quran, raises Asghar upon his hands, and he says, O oh people, if you have any cause in enmity, it is with me. What wrong has this child done to you? Do you not see how he dies of thirst? His mother has nothing to offer to him. If you feel that I shall drink your water, then come yourselves and place a drop of water into his mouth. But allow him not to die of this thirst. As Hussein said this, the enemies began to turn their faces and began to cry. Umar ibn Sa'ad, fearing descent, turns, O Hurmala, iqta' kalam Hussein. Put a stop to the speech of Hussein. Hussein, upon his trembling hands, raises us. O oh Lord, this is my final offering that I bring to you, snatched from a lap of a mother, that does not have any other to offer. O oh Lord, take him and complete my journey. Hormala, behead him. Hormala joins his arrow, an arrow with three heads. He joins his arrow upon the bow, targets the child, and his hand trembles. He takes aim once again. His hand trembles. Hormala, what causes this uncertainty in you? Away with Hussein. Omar and Sa'ad, look on. Who is that? May that be the mother of this child? This bewildered lady that appears outside the tent. Hormala, take aim and end this. Hormala takes aim. The arrow is released from the bow. It tears the air. Hussein pleads with Allah. It penetrates within the young neck. Asghar turns upon the hands of Hussein. His head hangs by the skin of its neck. The scene is such a shock upon the heart of Hussein that Hussein is unaware of what has happened. A few moments pass. When the hot blood drips from the neck of Azgar into the palm of Hussein, Hussein realizes Azgar has gone. Hussein begins to tremble uncontrollably. He is unable to control himself. As the blood pours from his palm, he looks to the skies. The skies tremble. He looks to the earth. The earth begins to shake. Hussein wipes the blood upon his beard and says, O oh child, like this, shall we be raised in front of your grandfather? O oh Lord, who preserves every soul with what they have done, bear witness upon what is happening. 
Hussein shakes violently. He cries out, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. He takes a few steps and stops, then retracts. I will say, O oh, Hussein, have you not extracted the dagger from the heart of Akbar? Have you not picked the torn arms of Abbas from the al -Qama? Have you not picked up the torn body of Qasim? <laughs> oh Hussein, why do you tremble so? What weight is there to this body? He calls out, Wa Ali, ya Wa Ali. I will say, Hussein, if you call to Ali, the one who has unhinged the Khaybar, call him not, for he has no strength to bear what you bear in your hands. I say, O oh, Hussein, why does your resolve break so? Move on. Hussein looks to me and says, O oh, man, you do not understand. He has a mother waiting for him, who I have promised that I shall bring back your child to you. How may I return him in this state? There is a cry from the heavens. O oh, Hussein, give him to me. There is a mother that awaits him with me who will quench your child. O oh, Hussein, move on. Hussein moves towards the tent. As he comes towards the tent, Sakina comes forward. After her is Umm Rubab. She says, O oh, Father, give my brother to me. He unveils Azga. When Rubab sees Azga, she says, O oh, child, have they slaughtered you as they slaughter camels? Matina Hussein.